Good evening. I'd like to call to order the special meeting of the City Council, Lakewood, Colorado, at 5.32 p.m. Um, phone number tonight is 1346-248-7799. Webinar ID is 984-5578-8719. You'll press pound after that. And then pound once more to join the meeting, star nine to request to speak. You'll be prompted when, um, then you'll be prompted to press star six. So star nine to request, star six to unmute. Um, we have two public hearings tonight, two ordinances. So there'll be public comment available on both of those. And with that, Mr. Clerk, if you please call the roll. Call. Here. Abel. Here. Vincent. Here. Gutwine. Beta. Here. Skilling. Here. Springsteen. Here. Franks. Here. Johnson. I am here. Labure. Here. Harrison. Here. And a quorum is present. All right. Thank you very much. So before we jump right into the business of tonight, I just want to give a quick Thank you to the city team, public works, mechanics, police, West Metro Fire for all they've done uh, these last couple of days in the blizzard that wasn't going to be, but sure turned into just about what everybody thought. And so I know crews have been working day and night and streets are still getting plowed. So we want to thank everybody and also thank the, the community and their thoughtfulness and their willingness to help neighbors as well as their patients as it's taken a little bit longer in some areas to get those plows out. So thank you for that. And with that, Mr. Clerk, will you please read item three into the record? Yes, sir. Item three is ordinance O-2021-5, authorizing a supplemental appropriation of $12,500,000 to the 2021 ad annual budget and authorizing expenditure of grant funds from the Denver Regional Council of Governments to assist the city of Lakewood in improving safety on Colfax Avenue between Wadsworth and Sheridan Boulevards. Great, thank you, sir. Uh, two things real quick, Councilor Gutwein, let, let the record reflect that she has joined the meeting and there was a request from Councilor Franks just to remind the public that this is an early start for this portion of it that was approved by city council some weeks ago to try to uh, address issues that need to be tackled. And the next regular meeting, I think, has over 20 items on it. So council decide to take this up at 5.30 p.m. instead of our regular 7. So council, the first one has to do with a pretty cool opportunity. And I'm curious, we'll do questions first. And this pertains to West Colfax from Teller to Sheridan. And Mr. Hutchison provided a, a memo and uh, Ms. Hudson has done a couple updates. Are there any questions that you have? All right, seeing none, I will, a little bit off here. Since we read it in, so before we do a motion, I need to open the public hearing on this ordinance. So I'll do that. Um, open the public hearing on ordinance 2021-5. If you wish to speak, please press star nine and the clerk will call on you. We'll do three minutes once we get your name and address or award. And again, this is for the West Colfax uh, supplemental appropriation uh, for grant expenditure. I do not see any hands up. Again, if you wish to speak on this item, star nine. We do have one, Mr. Bayer. And this is last four, nine, seven, eight, six. Right, if you would unmute yourself i will start your three minutes if you give us your name and address we'll get started yes this is roger ball 1068 south outcar street here in lakewood 
Okay, sir. Do you have a comment on this item? Yes, I do. Uh, I uh, I've looked over the material, uh, but I was wondering uh, before you really dive into this and move forward, whether it'd be a good idea to have an independent attorney look at this option for the sale of this property. So I think you're on the wrong subject, Mr. Ball. This is actually Ordinance 2021-5. Okay. That's Sorry. Facts. No, we can come back to you if you'd wish. All right, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Anybody else wish to speak on item 2021-5? Okay. I'm not seeing the other. Okay. We'll close public comment. I'll ask for a motion in a second, please. I move for the adoption of ordinance 2021-5 on second and final reading. Second. All right, motion and second. Any comments to this? Uh, I'll just make one. This is a, a big deal. Excited to have this. There's starting to uh, accumulate a lot of investment now on West Colfax, whether it's the stormwater or these improvements on one of the worst and most unsafe stretches of road in, in the metro area. So look forward to this, look forward to collaboration with Public Works. I want to thank Dr. Cog, as well as our planning department and our uh, actually our business community. They're all going to be engaged in this. So this is a, a big deal. It's a big number and it's going to go a long way. Go to our counselor in that area, as well as our Dr. Cog rep, Councilor LeBeer. Thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks, Mayor Paul. Um, yeah, I was just going to echo the same thing. This is a huge investment uh, in Lakewood. It's a huge investment on Colfax and, and Ward 2 in particular, and I'm just very excited to see it. I think this will be a great uh, opportunity to help curb some of the challenges we've had with pedestrian accidents and deaths uh, on Colfax, and I think uh, there'll be a lot of other benefits to the community as well, beautification, public safety, uh, infrastructure. So this is just a great win for the community. I was actually in a meeting earlier today where we might be seeing another win uh, coming up, so uh, a lot of exciting news in Lakewood. So thanks. And thanks to the team that made it happen. Public Works obviously did a, a great job and looking forward to those uh, future community discussions on this project. All right, anybody else? So let me shift over here. All right, seeing no other comments. Motion in a second. Please cast your votes. That looks like that passes 11 eyes, zero nays. Fantastic. All right, will the clerk please read item four into the record? Item four, ordinance O-2021-2, authorizing the sale of the Westland Town Center parking lot in accordance with that certain option contract entered into as of June 16th, 1992, between the city of Lakewood and the owners of the Westland Mall, Westland Town Center. All right, so I want to um, now go to a short presentation by Mr. Smith, and then we'll go to public comment. And just as a reminder, this is uh, something that's been in the community for some time certainly has created a lot of interest and uh, a lot of different parts to this complicated matter that uh, I'm sure some wish we weren't having to take before us tonight. I will um, also mention that, uh, well, we'll just go through with that. That's cool. So go ahead, Mr. Smith. Thank you very much, Mayor. I am uh, gonna share my screen and uh, present a uh, short PowerPoint presentation to give some background information on this particular ordinance. So let me do that right now and make that full screen and start from the beginning. I assume everyone can see that and I have a limited number of reaction screens on my uh, on my uh, uh, Zoom. So uh, if, the, if you need to interrupt me for any reason, please feel free to do so, but I'd have to have some folks uh, tell me that it's going on. Basically, ordinance is 2021 Dash two is in front of the council this evening. The ordinance itself consists of 
two pages of relatively typical ordinance language. Um, there are several pages of the actual option contract that's referred to in the title. And then there's also a map of the uh, property area, the subject property area. And we'll be going over that in just a moment. And also in this presentation uh, to council, there was a staff memo and an additional supplemental document that answered several questions about uh, this particular issue. Uh, this ordinance does basically three things. It affirms Lakewood's commitment to fulfill its under obligations under the option contract. Uh, Lakewood does have obligations under that option contract, and we'll talk a little bit more about those as the presentation goes on. The second thing that this ordinance does is it affirms Lakewood's commitment to fulfill its obligations under the city charter. Anytime there's an ownership transfer of property, it needs to be done through ordinance, and that's why this ordinance is in front of the council this evening. Third thing this ordinance does is it authorizes the city manager and her staff to implement all of the elements fulfilling this obligation. Um, so that's a, you know, what the ordinance does in a nutshell. Let's take a look at the uh, property area here. Uh, and I will uh, point out that this is an area of Lakewood. It's about a block, block and a half to the west of Kipling, uh, a little bit north of Colfax. Let me add on the streets uh, here to make this a little easier to navigate. Along the bottom, running from left to right, from west to east is Colfax Avenue. Along the top of this image, 17th Avenue, left to right as well. There are three north-south streets on this image, Quail, Owens, and Miller. Quail is the one furthest to the west, uh, furthest to the left-hand side of this image. Miller, furthest to the right or the east. Owens essentially runs down the middle of this uh, aerial photograph. I'll point out three projects that are relatively recently completed uh, in this area between Quail and Owens. Uh, the first is the West Link Station, uh, excuse me, the West Link Apartments at Oak Station. These three projects, by the way, represent about $140 million of private investment in just these three right here. But the West Link at Oak Station uh, is a multifamily market rate apartment complex, three story uh, buildings in that project. The uh, next one I'll mention is the Avenida. It's a market rate senior apartment complex, four story buildings there. When this aerial was taken, the project had not yet begun. It has since been completed and is uh, completed under that label that you see over there on the left-hand side of this image. Third one is the Advanced Healthcare, uh, which is a, a wellness rehabilitation facility. It's designed so that folks that are leaving the hospital but not quite ready to go home can continue their convalescence and rehabilitation um, there. So many jobs in there, doctors, nurses, uh, physical therapists, along with the custodial and uh, kitchen staff. Uh, those buildings are tall one story. Uh, a couple of buildings on that in that project are two stories as well. The area to the right of the screen between Owens and Miller, that's the area that's traditionally known as Westland. It was the home of the former Westland Mall. It's currently the home of the Westland Town Center. I'm gonna shade in some of the properties over in that area. Each of the different colorings of these properties represents a different property ownership. So the first one there in green at the corner of 17th and Owens, that's uh, West, uh, excuse me, that's uh, uh, Westland Park. Westland Park's an uh, acre and a half uh, public park, just recently received a neighborhood participation program grant. Uh, those funds, along with funds from the community resources budget, um, will go to improving some of the amenities there at, uh, at uh, Westland Park. Um, and that will remain a park regardless of how the uh, rest of the area redevelops uh, so the residents out there can enjoy that park into the future. The area under purple um, is owned by a company named Seritage. If you take the word Sears and Heritage and you put them together, you get the word Seritage. And that company is uh, responsible for working with former Sears properties all across the country. And this happens to be a former Sears store. It was two stories in the main building that's up to the north there. Uh, in the lower building, that one story building down below, that's the former Sears Auto Care Center. And it's a different ownership than the rest of the, uh, the properties. Over there on the uh, right-hand side, there are three properties that have been highlighted. The first one in pink is the uh, Bank of the West uh, building, about one story. The red one is a uh, billiards business that's been in Lakewood for many, many, many years, um, also one story. And then the purple building is the uh, former First Bank headquarters. Many people know that the uh, current headquarters for First Bank is further to the west on Colfax. That building's about seven stories in height. I'll outline here in orange, the area that's owned by RCG Ventures out of Atlanta, Georgia, their retail developer, but that's the uh, Westland Town Center. And then of course, one other building off in uh, a little bit to the south there. Uh, the uh, RCG Ventures are the successors in ownership 
to the uh, folks that redeveloped from the Westland Mall into the Westland Town Center uh, back in the early 90s. You can see that the Lowe's building is furthest to the east over there. That's the Lowe's uh, Home Improvement Center. So the rest of that property between Owens and Miller, 17th and, and, and Colfax, this area that I'm shading in in yellow, is commonly referred to as the Westland parking lot. It's 21.54 acres. It's owned by the city of Lakewood, but it's owned in a very atypical way. And we'll talk about why that ownership isn't like what most people would consider property ownership to be. You can also see that the way that the property is aligned, it outlines or rings in the uh, RCG Ventures property and land locks it into, into place. But we'll talk about that just a little bit more as we move along. We'll talk a little bit about the history of the uh, this area in Westland. Again, originally home to the Westland Mall um, from the 1960s to 1990s, three decades of uh, real good production at the uh, mall, lots of jobs, lots of shopping to be done, lots of folks uh, very uh, engage with that portion of the community, a lot of activity there. You can see from this archive image that there was a made ENF in the uh, in the Westland Mall. Um, it was uh, did very well, but by the time it got to the 1990s, the early 1990s, it was really just a shadow of its former self. It's kind of hard to put ourselves back in the in the uh, mindset of the folks that were uh, running like within those days, the uh, public officials and whatnot, but they really saw an economic obstacle in front of them, declining sales, the, the buildings were beginning to be run down. Um, the, the Colorado Mills didn't exist yet. Um, the uh, Belmar had not been uh, reconverted from the from the Villa Italia Mall at uh, Alameda and uh, Wadsworth. So a lot of folks were uh, concerned about the declining sales and the revenue that this city was uh, was uh, getting from this project. So they were very concerned about it and were very anxious to to do something to to make this uh, go into the future decades. So with those greatly declining sales and the high vacancy and deterioration of the buildings. Um, the city was anxious to be involved with uh, getting the project converted from an indoor mall to an outdoor power center. And that's what happened in the early 90s. It was converted. And one of the ways the city participated in that was it acquired ownership of the parking lot um, through an eminent domain action. A lot of times an eminent domain action is called a condemnation. And, uh, we obtained that property for $5 million. That $5 million was put back into the project right away in order to facilitate and hasten the redevelopment of the, uh, the mall into the town center. Since we acquired it uh, for that parking lot purpose, uh, we needed to continue to use it for a parking lot. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment as well. Um, but since the acquisition, the responsibilities uh, for the maintenance and the insurance of the parking lot have been with the Westland Town Center owners. So they've, they've been doing that insurance and maintenance of the parking lot for these uh, many years. I mentioned that the ownership is uh, very atypical. There's three factors that really work on constraining what the city is able to do with this property. And the first is that means of acquisition. We argued that the public purpose for obtaining this property was for public parking. So that means that we needed to keep that parking lot for parking. We couldn't use it for other purposes. Couldn't convert it over to maybe a park or a public building or that sort of a thing. It had to remain a parking lot. The second is an agreement that's called the Construction Operation and Reciprocal Easement Agreement. That's a mouthful, I know. If you take the first letter of each of those words, put them together, you get an acronym that's C-O-R-E-A. We pronounce it Korea like the country in Asia. Um, but that's what we mean when we say Korea. It's that uh, that operating agreement, that reciprocal agreement. And it actually defines the number of parking places that have to remain in the project. There are three parties to the Korea, the, uh, the Thornton Town, or excuse me, the Westland Town Center, uh, RCG Ventures Ownership, the Seritage uh, property, and the city. All of us are party to that construction reciprocal agreement. It means that as long as the city owns that property, has to be used for parking, and that agreement goes all the way out until the year 2082. The third thing I'll mention is the option contract that's part of the ordinance that, that you see before you. And that essentially that option contract uh, was done so that the owners of the Westland Town Center, uh, excuse me here, let me check my notes real quickly. It, it gives the uh, owners of the Westland Town Center the option to buy back the parking lot from the city for the greater of the remaining balance on the sales tax and revenue bonds that were used to finance the project or $1 million, whichever is greater. So since those bonds were paid off in 2012, the predetermined value or price of the parking lot 
um, under this contract is $1 million and it's been that way for about eight years or so. That'll bring us into the uh, kind of the more recent history from the 1990s to the 2010s, the uh, era of the Westland Town Center. Um, many stores uh, participated in the Westland Town Center. Uh, you can see from this image, there was a Gordman's there. There was a Big Lots. At one point, there was even a Radio Shack um, there. Um, in, uh, the, the production of the of the Thornton, or excuse me, the Westland Town Center was very good uh, during those years. Uh, lots of jobs, lots of uh, shopping to be done, lots of activity from a city perspective. Well, during those years, the city uh, authorized several uh, estoppel certifications. Now, estoppel certifications, I'm going to make sure I, I read this so I get this uh, exactly correct. Estoppel certifications basically assure folks that are associated with the property that certain real estate contracts are, are in place. But let me read it here. Estoppel is a judicial device uh, that prevents or stops a person or organizations um, from going back on their word. So the parties holding these certifications uh, are entitled to rely on the, represent uh, the representations that they hold inside there. Um, and they're able to use those representations in court uh, if for whatever reason there is a, uh, one of the elements turns out to be inaccurate or uh, a stop party tries to invalidate uh, any of those representations. So in this context, uh, retail leases that were signed there, uh, some financing for retail operations, all asked for uh, estoppel certifications. The city participated in those to say what real estate contracts were in place. The city participated in those in the 1990s, did so in the uh, 2000s, they did so in the 2010s. So there's a lot of estoppel certifications indicating that all of the contracts that were uh, at that time uh, were in place and were valid, including that option contract. So uh, the companies and the successors in interest, including RCG, have all relied on the certifications of and that the option contract was and remains valid. So having said that, I'll uh, let you know that the RCG Ventures, the owners of the Westland Town Center, have notified Lakewood of their intent to uh, exercise the option contract um, for the ownership transfer of the properties commonly referred to as the Westland parking lot. So they made formal notification of that as per the, per the contract. And that wraps up essentially the background information on ordinance 02021-2 um, and of course that authorizes the sale of the Westland Town Center parking lot in accordance with that uh, option contract. I'm going to stop sharing the screen for just a moment uh, and mention that all of these materials were uh, on our Liquid Speaks, our public uh, platform uh, where the public can participate with these materials. They've been there since about the 5th of March um, and there were three comments on there. Uh, on the uh, Lakewood Speaks uh, platform. And with that, I will uh, be happy to answer any questions that the, that the uh, council or the mayor may have. Um, the staff is on standby as well to answer questions at uh, your discretion. But I'll stop speaking and give plenty of opportunity for public comment on this issue. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Smith, thank you very much. And thank you for that great document that was put together um, that answered a lot of the questions that were derived from the community. So with that, we will go open the public hearing, go to public comment. And looks like Mr. Ball, we could start with you to, um, since you were in line here. And Mr. Ball can just press star six. Star six, Mr. Ball, and we'll get you rolling. Three minutes, I'll let you know when you're about 30 seconds out. Okay, thank you very much. So my concern is this property, 21 and a half acres, is worth a tremendously amount of money, much more than a million dollars. Uh, you know, if you look around Lakewood, homes are selling for a million dollars. Uh, this is 21 and a half acres of prime Lakewood real estate. And I think it would behoove the council to have an independent law review of this contract to make sure that we are on spot on on this so that uh, you know we're going to be missing maybe nine million dollars by exercising this it's a lot of money that the city could use I know I've heard about all the sales tax that is short because of COVID and everything 
but I think it would be behoove us to look into that and have it reviewed by independent counsel. That's all I have, sir. Thank you, Mr. Ball. Mr. Rome, next. With the phone number last four, eight, eight, four, five. All right. You are unmuted with star six. If you give us your name and address or award, I'll start your three minutes. Diane Duffy and I live in Ward 1. I'm going to assume that the council has um, looked at all the legal issues with this and I don't want to address those tonight. Lakewood will and should continue to develop, but it should be a partnership between the community and the developers. Developers should want to come here and we should welcome them. The community should have a say in what can and can't be built on a piece of property. That's called zoning. And conversely, someone purchasing the property has every right to know what they can do with it. That's used by right. So there shouldn't be so much controversy. Now, per this existing contract, the property you're discussing must remain a parking lot for these retail stores. Seems pretty clear. Now, 30 years later comes the owner and they want to purchase this property for, okay, let's admit it, it's a bargain price. The neighborhood is on edge since it would seem they must have other plans for this than a parking lot. Why else would they be giving up the tremendous tax advantage? They have all the use of this parking lot without having to pay the property tax of over $200,000 a year. The city doesn't have to pay property tax. So we're, no one is paying property tax currently on that, but they have the use of that. So they must have some reason they, they are now willing to pay that tax. Some neighborhood leaders contacted the owner since we're just finishing up the West Colfax Vision Plan. It would be nice to include any new upcoming projects. All we could get from them was that anything built there would conform to Lakewood zoning. Well, with the current definition of mixed use, which this is zoned, that could be just about anything. And we all realize that. And you also know there's going to be a huge public outcry since everyone is going to be expecting something different from this property. Why not get in front of this one? It would take the controversy out of this if you first reviewed the newly revised West Colfax vision plan. Set the zoning to align with the vision for this important part of the city. At that point, the purchaser can make an informed decision. 30 seconds. If he wishes to exercise his option and move forward. And the community will know what's coming. You know, I would think this council would be tired of these controversial issues by now. Let's start getting ahead of these projects instead of chasing them. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you. Next, Mr. Rome. What? <clears throat> Excuse me, last four, seven, eight, one, zero. Good evening, seven, eight, one, zero. If you press, press star six unmute and uh, give us your name and address we'll get your time rolling it's like you're muted star six strom could you call out those last four digits again i can't see them yes last four of your phone number seven eight one zero seven eight one zero Caller 7810, press star six. There you go. Looks like you're unmuted. If you give us your name and address, we'll get you going. Yes, sorry about that. Um, this is Marianne Ortiz. And my address, I, I live on Tabor Street in Lakewood. All right, please go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so... Um, I'm the president of Dapplewood Valley Association, representing over 2,000 households in Lakewood and unincorporated Jefferson County. The ABA is not in favor of the sale of the parking lot. We've been working diligently with the um, West Colfax 2040 vision plan, and we have 
really exciting things that we would like to be in that space. And we want to work with a willing developer to make those visions realized. Um, how is the city of Lakewood benefiting from this lopsided deal? Why is the current city council attempting to make up for this smelly, messy deal of a long ago city council? Why is RCG in the driver's seat of the deal that was improperly executed by a previous city council? I have lots of questions. Um, in conclusion, I implore you to vote no on selling the parking lot for $1 million. Please do not allow this sale to happen, but instead help facilitate cooperation and coordination between RCG, the surrounding neighborhoods, and the West Colfax 2040 Vision Plan. The updated West Colfax 2040 Vision Plan will be presented before WCCA and Lakewood City Council this summer, and I'm urging you to wait until we present our vision. During these months between now and summer, potentially City Council could reach out to the developer and request that RCG clarify their intention for Westland Town Center and the parking lot. RCG could then use the neighborhood focus groups to bring insight into what types of uses would be successful at Westland Town Center. This technique has been very successful in other nearby communities. City of Lakewood counselors, please do not allow this sale to happen, but instead wait a few short months for the 2040 vision plan to be fully developed and presented, and then help foster coordination between the surrounding neighborhoods, City of Lakewood and RCG. With this synergy, great things can happen in the future for the Westland Town Center site. That's it for me. Thank you. Jerome? Last four of one, two, six, six. Our one, two, six, six. Go ahead and unmute with star six and give us your name and address and we'll get your time going. Good evening. This is Janet Draper. I live on Holman Street in Lakewood. Um, I agree with the former caller. I do not know what that plan for Westland redevelopment is, but I'm really happy that the citizens who are live nearby there have input. Uh, it appears to me as a citizen of Lakewood that the old agreement seems preposterous. I would urge the city council to renegotiate or to go to court on behalf of citizens, uh, future and current citizens behalf. If, if my house is not, but if my house is worth 600,000 and I had made a promise to sell it to somebody for a hundred thousand, I could renegotiate with them. I could go and say, well, you don't get the house, but I can give you 50 to 100,000. If I then sold my house later, I would still net 500,000. So I'm looking for a creative deal here, one that would be a win-win for citizens. How about having a current objective commercial, maybe more than one commercial appraisers establish the fair market value with no restrictions and no predetermined um, limitations? as to what that land, what the highest and best use was. Perhaps Lakewood Council could prepare a court case. I would say we could negotiate a buyout. We could sell fair market rate. We could redevelop with the local citizens. How about thinking green? How about thinking sustainability and future home ownership instead of six, you know, six story dense apartments, which may in 10 years be another problem. It occurs to me that NREL is just over the hill and maybe a partnership with the National Renewable Energy uh, Association could be of benefit. Thank you for hearing my comments. Great, thank you very much. All right, Ms. Rome, anything else? Anybody else wish to speak who hasn't had an opportunity? Please raise your hand, star nine. Uh, all the callers we had all spoke so i think we're good all right so we'll go ahead and close public comment and um we will begin with council questions i know there's going to be a lot so we'll save the comments until after the motion is made 
And if we could start with one or two questions from each counselor and uh, we'll wait till everybody has an opportunity and then I'll go back around uh, again. So with that, and forgive me, I'm trying to keep my order. It looks like I had Vincent, LaBeer, Harrison, and Abel. Okay. <clears throat> I have a, uh, I have one question, then I have kind of a common question, so we'll come back to that at the end. But my question is, is there seems, and maybe somebody can clarify this, there seems to be some um, information and verbiage out there that the Westland uh, property has already been blighted and therefore they would not have to adhere to the initiative 200 um, and they would would not have to work they would get exemptions um, could somebody clarify that for me and for the public certainly Ms. Hudson who do you want to um, I, thank you mayor sorry to interrupt you I'd like Robert Smith to take a run at that please thank you Yes, Councillor Vincent, this property is in the urban renewal area and therefore uh, in accordance with uh, initiative 200, it is exempt. Uh, it's in an area that's exempt from requiring allocations um, to go forward with housing projects. So um, if there were a housing project to occur on Westland, it would not be subject to those restrictions in, in the uh, strategic growth initiative. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So then it looks like I had Councillors Harrison, LaBeer, Abel and Skill. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, in my non-legal mind, need someone to go back over the discussion of estoppel um, because of the fact that I think there were a lot of people that were asking the question about why couldn't we go back in and renegotiate the, the call? So um, someone with legal mind, if you could do that one more time to make sure I understand it as well as people tuning in understand it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Mayor, I would ask our city attorney, Allison McKinney-Brown, to respond to that, please. Thank you. Good evening, Ms. Ms. McKinney-Brown. Good evening, and I'll fix my camera the next time I turn my camera off because I know I'm sitting a little bit low. Um, is Stoppel is a legal concept whereby um, the law determines that someone cannot go back after the fact and claim something is not true. So it's, it is uh, by having someone sign an estoppel agreement, the uh, parties are both agreeing that a set of facts is as stated. So the city over time did sign three different estoppel agreements and uh, as you know, I can't really give legal advice in an open meeting, that's absolutely inappropriate. But what those estoppel agreements were referring to was a series of 16 agreements that were entered into between June of 1992 and the completion of the condemnation, which was 1996. So in ordinance, 9210 authorized uh, the city to enter into those agreements that were necessary to begin redevelopment of the Westland Mall. What, uh, it specifically spoke to uh, a Westland Center agreement and the city entered into multiple Westland Center agreements between 1992 and 1996. Um, one of those Westland Center agreements referred to the option agreement. The Westland Center agreement referred to the uh, Korea and redoing the Korea. And both of the, uh, and that also specifically referred to the option agreement. The uh, option to resell the land was approved by the city in 1992. The condemnation was finalized by the court in 1996 and the condemnation approved by the court referenced back to the Westland Center Agreement, which was at that point in its sixth version. And uh, uh, it refers back to uh, a compensation value that's set, set uh, within the Westland Center Agreement for the actual purchase, the, well, the condemnation purchase price. So 
that's kind of an overview of of what estoppel means and what was referenced within the estoppel agreements. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so the my second question is, with all the estoppel agreements in place, is it your um, no, I won't ask that. Let me say it in a, in a different way. Can the contract be renegotiated at this point with all the estoppel agreements in place? At this, I've got to be careful because I don't want to I realize that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Meeting. At this point, the city council is being asked to complete the, and I need to say the whole statement. The city council is being asked to complete the final stage of an agreed to transfer. And when when the uh, amount of $1 million is stated, that's not a purchase price. The $1 right. million dollars is the transfer price that both parties agreed to in writing was the amount to transfer it back because the value was the amount that the city would make based on the redevelopment. So. Could we go back and renegotiate? We could, and we could see if a court would let us reopen uh, that contract. But the, the issue is we've got 30 years of statements to overcome, one of which is explaining that the $1 million was, was basically just a, a number. It was just a number established. The value of that redevelopment and the, and the sales tax was in fact the value that the city was assigning to that property and that was however much that might have been uh okay i'll i'll hold my comment for later but thank you very much i appreciate that thank you then i have counselors labeer abel skilling and springsteen thank you mayor um uh, just one quick question and I should have got it in earlier, so nobody has the answer. You know, no hard feelings, but <laughs> I'm just wondering uh, if we have a sense of what kind of revenue uh, this prop this property is brought in for the city, sort of sales tax revenue. I know that was somebody asked that question. I think at the last meeting. Yeah, thank you. I believe we provided that in a written materials, but I would ask um, Robert to remind people of the information in the materials because we did look that up. So thank you for bringing that up. Well, thank you for providing it. <laughs> yeah, we did look that up and it's in the supplemental uh, uh, document that's on there. Uh, essentially the the amount that the uh, Thor or, excuse me, the Westland Town Center has generated over the years has reliably been between one and $2 million of sales tax each year. If you take the average over the 27 or so years on there, you come up with a number that's around $37 million is what it's generated in sales taxes since the conversion to the, to the Western Town Center. Okay, great, thank you, appreciate that. Councillor Abel. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and Mr., uh, I believe Mr. Smith offered the supplemental uh, parking lot information document but in that document, it says that it indicates that the use of legislative zoning uh, on this property would be a, an uphill battle. And I was wondering in view of the fact that we just uh, a few weeks ago legislatively rezoned uh, three parcels over in the Rooney Valley why this would be a higher bar. Can anybody explain that? Or maybe the question isn't very clear. I think I think I understand your question, Councillor Abel. Um, it, Robert, are you in a position to answer that? Or I think we have our planning director in the that back room. So Robert, you take a stab at it. And in the meantime, Bruce, will you pull Travis Parker into the onto this room, please? You bet, happy to do that. In the supplemental document that, uh, that council member Abel is referring to, um, it says, is it possible to legislatively rezone the property? The answer is yes. The quick answer is yes. Um, we did get provide some information about uh, what spot zoning is and, 
generally some reasons that uh, or generally I used to change a property from one zoning to another. Um, and there are a variety of those, um, but just mentioned all of those. So um, if there was an indication that it would be uh, challenging, it's, it's often challenging to rezone property uh, legislatively, but it is possible. And that's what we were trying to, to bring across that. Yes, there is a possibility of that, but that it's that, that it takes some energy and effort to get there. Okay. Yeah, uh, and I'm sorry, it doesn't look as if uh, Travis has joined us. I just texted him to see if he, if he will. So I can he, hardly hear you, Ms. Hodson. Um, Travis, I'm sorry, I'll try to fix that. Travis isn't in the building right now, so I just texted him. Okay. Uh, secondly, why was this not done? in 1992. Uh, Ms. McKinney Brown kind of indicated the transaction was complete then, but without this ordinance, that transaction would never be complete. So does anybody know why in 1992 they didn't go any farther than authorizing the city manager and the city attorney to negotiate the terms of the deal. I believe that is the last resolution I saw. So how did we get here? I'm gonna make a guess at that. And I think that's all we can do is guess, but I can tell you that I did contact previous counsel. So the uh, attorneys for the city back in 1992 and asked them what was going on and based on their memory, um, what they thought was that everything was in place, but because of the way our charter reads, that that final step of approving the transfer had to happen at the time of the transfer. So that's just how they read the charter at that, that point. The other thing is keep in mind, when the agreement was passed, it was prior to completion of the condemnation. So the, the option agreement to transfer back and establishing a value was four years before the city actually owned the property per condemnation. So if they, they couldn't do a, an ordinance at the time they approved any of those additional agreements because the city didn't own them, the city was working toward create, uh, establishing ownership. And as you read through that multitude of agreements, what you see is that the uh, city was, over the course of four years, negotiating to uh, do the condemnation with an agreed upon value uh, between the parties, instead of bringing in the appraisers and doing all of those things that are typically done in a condemnation. There was, it was just four years of negotiation and agreeing that eventually this would be transferred back was just one of these keys of the negotiation, as best okay. I can read. This was the city's first stab at, quote, urban renewal. Uh, so I guess a couple of rookie mistakes might not be uh, unforgivable, but it sure puts us in a tough place right now. Thank you. I have a couple more for later. Thank you, Council. I appreciate that. <clears throat> I have Councillor Skilling, then Councillor, or sorry, Mayor Pro Tem Skilling and Councillor Springsteen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to follow up on a point that uh, Councillor Abel or a question he was just asking that we heard from uh, uh, Diane Duffy during her public comment because I share a lot of those sentiments that she was discussing. Um, the the question I have is about the vested rights aspect. Um, I wanna be clear in two regards and make sure that I'm accurate. I'm understanding from the supplemental information that was sent out that there are no vested rights on the property that would somehow entitle uh, the landowner to, uh, for lack of a better word, protections against any amended zoning. Is that accurate? Uh, yes, that's accurate. There are no additional vested right development rights in the uh, in the in the property, so they're subject to the current zoning and those sorts of things. But there are no additional vested development rights in that property. 
And secondly, there are no, and I know for this type of property it wouldn't exist, but I'm just gonna throw out examples of what you know planning applications look like. There's no platting or other types of applications uh, that are currently pending in our offices for approval. Is that accurate as far as development on that process, on that property? That's correct. There are no development applications for this property at this time. And the, the 2040, uh, the vision plan, we heard some in public comment. I think we've heard some other from council members as well. The 2040 vision plan is something that's been out there and is actively being discussed in the community. I believe it's probably even been discussed directly with RCG and others, but that plan is not something we're thinking about doing. It's actually in the works and folks have been on notice of that plan. Is that also accurate? Yes, the plan's been in place for about five years and it's really an updating of the of the plan that was approved five years ago. So the 2040 plan's been in place and shared with everyone that uh, has an interest in developing along Colfax uh, Avenue because it's the 2040 plan for Colfax Avenue um, and uh, it's being refreshed right now. And so what was being referenced in the public comments is that refresh is, is coming forward in the upcoming months. And finally, the uh, the use of overlays and not site specific, but area specific to conform to plans. And I cite, for example, the um, Union Corridor plan that's that's coming up or on Federal Center, there are overlays that we can use as part of zoning processes. Is that also accurate? The short answer is yes, overlays can be used. Uh, overlays are not in place right at the moment. Uh, and I'm not an expert on how those those come about. Um, uh, certainly the planning uh, director can give more details on it, but yes, overlays are a thing that can be used to help with uh, augment or supplement zoning requirements. And thank you, Mr. Smith, for all those answers. I was trying to do it really quick. It wasn't a cross exam. I was just trying to be quick with them. And also thank you uh, to Ms. McKinney Brown for your answer to Mr. Abel's question, because I also had that on my list and I think you did a thorough job of explaining that. So thank you for that. Okay, so I do see that Mr. Parker has uh, tuned in. You came in on the tail of Mr. Smith referencing you and then previous question by Councillor Abel pertained to uh, the addendum that came out saying that a legislative rezone would be potentially challenging. I, I don't think that's the accurate word, but some verbiage along the line of, of that or what that would be or how that would be. Uh, yeah, so, so the question is, is is a legislative rezone possible or what is a legislative rezone? Or, or a little more explanation around the comment in the supplemental materials that described a legislative rezone as being difficult or a challenge, maybe a little more context around that. Councilor Abel, isn't that, isn't that what you were asking? Councilor Abel? Yes. Thank you. Fair enough, and I, and I apologize uh, for my, my late appearance. Um, so yeah, basically a, a legislative rezone is council rezoning a, a group of properties um, rather than a property owner rezoning their own property. So any property owner in the city can apply for a rezoning of their own property. If the city council wants to do a legislative rezone, it's generally for a larger area um, and for some specific purpose. Um, so it would be legally challenging or legally challenged if the council was to particular to, put, to pick a single property and rezone that property. Um, however, if the council has a larger purpose in mind, say they wanted to rezone all of Colfax as we did in 2007, or wanted to rezone transit areas as we did in 2008 or nine, um, then that's the sort of thing that can be done as a, re as a legislative rezone. I'm sorry, Abel, you, do you want to do a quick follow-up on that? You're muted. I can't hear you. Hold on, Council, you're, you're asking your question and nobody can hear. Most folks prefer it that way. <laughs> the, uh, the context of uh, Legislative rezoning is not the area, but multiple properties. 
I believe. Isn't that correct? So, yeah, they, yeah, exactly. Not a single property. Right. Um, and following but, through on that a few months ago, a couple of months ago, we rezoned an area in the Rooney Valley known as Red Rocks, I believe. It was a legislative rezoning, and it was a relatively smaller area. It certainly was bigger than 21 acres, but it was uh, all under one ownership. But it was three, uh, three zone areas. How was that divided up, Travis? There were there was a commer couple of commercial areas where residential wasn't allowed. Yeah, and. and, and the key there is that was also done in conjunction with the property owner. So yeah, yeah we, we, we did it as a legislative rezoning. True, true, true enough, true enough. So and yeah, there were- avoided, And that way it avoided a number of uh, steps, including neighborhood hearings. That's true. So, That's true. so if that is, uh, uh, so I don't see why these three, there are, there's more than one property here we're talking about. There's the Serenade site, there's RCG, there's the billiard store, there's the old bank building and the other bank building. So we could conceivably rezone five properties. I don't know that it would come down to that, but so I, I and I don't want to debate it with you. I just wanted to point those things out. Wouldn't wouldn't in those terms? Wouldn't it uh, qualify for legislative rezoning and not be spot zoning? It it could. I mean, obviously, the definition of spot zoning is squishy, right? And so, uh, you know, we could be challenged, and and we don't know how that decision might turn out in court. If we're not challenged, it doesn't matter. So, sure. ultimately, it comes down to whether we're challenged on it. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Parker, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Councillor Springsteen, then I have Gutwine, then Johnson, and then Councillor Bita, if you wanna round it out with any questions, that'll get us through our whole first round. Councillor Springsteen. Hi, um, so I've been looking at comments directed at us through email and Lakewood Speaks and have many, many concerns. Um, one is why can't we wait on this issue until we have more information and public input? Because a lot of people have felt that this has not been a transparent process, that it has been kept behind closed doors and uh, that it's just a process in favor of developers and not for the people. And uh, for instance, uh, throwing this special meeting in there at 530 on a Monday night instead of during our regular seven o'clock meeting when obviously there's gonna be less public input because people aren't gonna understand why this meeting is happening at this time. And so what this brought to mind was first world problem. This is a first world problem. Uh, my family always jokes about that when we're talking about a problem where there is so much money and privilege that there is so much money and privilege that people do things that people in a desperate society would never do. And one of those things is giving away a piece of property that's worth potentially $17 million for a million dollars. That doesn't make sense. And so as a champion of the people with a fiduciary duty to the people of Lakewood, I don't know how we give away an expensive piece of property like that at a time of financial crisis due to unprecedented situation of the COVID pandemic. When we're asking the average Joe to pay more in taxes to make up for our budget shortfalls, we need to be fighting for every, every single thing like that, that will help the people of this city to recover from this financial crisis. And so 
it's a little confusing to me that we go behind closed doors in executive session and uh, get legal advice and information. And then we only hear one side of that legal advice when we come into public. I don't understand that. It's like we're being pushed in a certain direction and I don't agree with that. I, If we're not gonna do Counselor, legal let's, advice. Let's get these questions answered. I'm hearing one as to timing. I'm hearing another one. Why do you not interrupt any other counselor, but you always interrupt me, Mayor? Because I'm trying to get your questions answered, and I want to save comments for after the motion is made. So I've heard three or four questions, and I want to make sure that they get addressed. So one is I heard timing. Are you discriminating against me again, Mayor? Do I heard? Because I would like to finish my comments and my questions, please. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna answer three questions first, and that was timing. No, that's not the rules, Mayor. How do you put a value on this versus uh, regular market value? And I think please, the third is please, why, please why do don't we, put words in my mouth, Mayor. This why is do we time deal, to talk about this. Okay. Why do we deal with these in executive session? So those are three that I've. Heard. I'm trying to make sure there's three more hands up. We have a lot of questions on a complicated issue, and then we can certainly come back and ask more questions. I would love to see you do that to Counselor Skilling, just even one time. You don't do that to other counselors, but you do it to me. All right, so you want questions. Okay, why, why are we voting on this tonight? Why are we not standing up for people in the time of financial crisis on this issue? Why are we giving legal advice on only one side of it tonight? Um, why are we uh, approving a transfer that never even happened? It was not complete. Everybody has talked about that. There was never an ordinance made. It's incomplete. Why are we doing that? And then finally, uh, why aren't we standing up for the people on this one? Almost all the comments I saw um, are of people who are disgusted and concerned about this. We stand up for uh, the people on certain issues um, and then not others. And so that's another question I have. Why on 2090 were we fine with all of this? Okay. So, so let's, let's start with those four questions. One of them can't be answered by staff because that has to do with counsel and, and the opinion of why are people not standing up for the community or, or not. That's that's not a staff question. Certainly that's a, a policy discussion. Uh, so the legal advice question, uh, timing and the approval of transfer. Not sure who wants to take those on or if you need more clarification. Um, so Robert, do you want to talk about the timing of this particular um, particular issue in front of city council? I know we've had a couple of executive sessions and maybe Allison, I can ask you to speak about the purpose of the executive session as opposed to, an, uh, and the purpose for that as it relates to the charter um, and the reason for doing that. So how about if we do those two? Can you start Robert, please? I certainly can. The reason for the timing right now is that well, part of the option agreement was a uh, ability to uh, complete the transaction within 45 days. And we've uh, made certain that the, uh, the owners of the property were aware of the fact that we simply couldn't move in 45 days that in order to get the ordinance that we believe that we need in order to complete the ownership transfer um there's a lot of uh, informing the public and, and uh, those kinds of things public notification um but that 45 day clause within the option contract is driving a lot of the, the timing in there the original notification happened this last summer um, we've been working with the council and the community about um this issue for quite some time in terms of letting them know the elements that are associated with it, but there's still that that timing that's being driven by the option contract itself. That's the reason that the timing is, isn't it? 
So what is the penalty if we go past the 45 days? What's the penalty? I'm sorry, Councillor Springsteen, I, I, don't, I can't answer that question. It sounds more like a legal question um, than a uh, development question. I agree. Allison, can you speak to that as well as the, the need for the executive sessions and the purpose for those? Yes. And how, how they're allowed. Thank you. So the executive session question is just a general question. And this is a great question to ask because it, it helps to educate the public out there who aren't attorneys to understand what the role of the attorney is. So the role of the attorney is to advise their client. And when uh, an attorney wants to give uh, the broadest possible information and, and answer questions of a legal nature, um, that typically ha happens behind closed doors because uh, the information as it's being processed and understood between an attorney and a client should not be something that can be used against the client later. So if it's a private client, you, you all understand that an attorney working with a private client can never speak about a topic publicly um, and, and uh, public clients have the same right to have that relationship with their attorney. So that's why we go into executive Who sessions. is Who is the client, Ms. Brown? Who uh, is your client? So according to the charter, the client is the city of Lakewood, which includes the city council, city manager, and city departments, and city boards and commissions. And so the client is uh, one of those groups that is being advised by the attorney in that moment. So what about the people? Who is their attorney? Um, they, if, if an individual does not like an action of the city, then they have, then they are putting themselves in a position adverse to the city and they have different counsel for that. They, they oftentimes uh, hire their own counsel uh, to look into those issues. But by charter, the city attorney is the city, uh, is the attorney just for the entity, which is defined as city council, city manager, city departments, and city boards and commissions. And city council represents who, Ms. Brown? Uh, you, the city council is, are elected to uh, provide service to the constituents. And that is a different relationship from the city attorney to the city attorney's client. So I'm still confused about who the city attorney represents. If uh, you represent city council, you represent the people, correct? No, no, that's not what the charter says. And, and I, uh, I have to, to represent the city in conformance with the terms of the city's charter. So that was the first question. And then there was a second question um, that I'm sorry, I've forgotten. Ms. Hodgson, did you write that down? I think it was pertaining to the transfer, approving a transfer that was not completed. Is that accurate, Councillor Springsteen? I think that's accurate. Well, I did ask a question about why we are approving a transfer without fighting it that was never actually legally complete. Yes. So that's a question for the city council. That's about will the city council approve or not approve? And that is certainly not my place to respond to that. Well, if there were a contract that was not accurately signed would that contract be upheld or is there wiggle room this particular agreement and, and i generically I, I that's that's not appropriate for me to answer but this uh, this particular agreement was part of, I believe, 16 different agreements that were entered into um, as consideration to get RCG to agree to the condemnation. 
that's that's what we all know. We've all looked at the agreements. Whether or not the city wants to uh, finalize that transfer or not, that's a decision of the city council. Okay. Let's keep going. Thank you, uh, Councillor Gutwein, then Johnson, and then Beta. If you have anything you'd like to ask, and then we can start the second round. Uh, thank you. I just have, you know, a lot of the questions that I had have been answered, but I just want to ask one that we've heard from the community um, a number of times and that I've got emails about. We, there, there is an answer in the supplemental document, but just in case folks didn't um, have a chance to read that or, you know, understand. But the, the question is, if we own this property, why can't we just make it, you know, why can't we make it a park? Or why can't we use it for affordable housing? Or why can't we use it for some other, you know, need that we have? And I, I just want um, to go through that answer again here tonight, because I think it's really important for people to understand that. I, I would ask Robert to respond to that. It looks like you have the document in front of you for the purpose of the viewing audience. And you're on, you're muted. Uh, yes, uh, essentially you're referring to, can, can the city do whatever it wants to do with that, the property? And the answer is, is no, it's constrained by those three things that we, we talked about in the presentation. Um, and those three things were the means of acquisition, the, uh, the construction operating reciprocal easement agreement, and the, uh, and the option contract; those con those contracts uh, are all part of the of, of the uh, the process and part of the property. So we can't simply disregard those contracts and use the property for something that's not outlined in those in those three documents. That's the the, the short answer. I can certainly go into any of those uh, again, but that's essentially the short answer: is those three documents really constrain what the city is able to do with the property. Thank you. That, that's it for right now. Thank you. Forgive me, Councillor Franks, too, after Councillor Johnson. Thank you. Um, since Sears is actually adjacent and they are part of the parking lot agreement, have they been approached and what is their take on all of this? We, we work with the Heritage folks as, as well. Um, at this point, they haven't formally done any kind of uh, application for their, their property. We've talked about the, the Korea in general um, with them, uh, and the option contract is something that comes up. If the option contract is exercised, the city is then exercised from that uh, uh, operating agreement. So um, they're, they're in a place where they're, they're waiting for some level of, of uh, res resolution in terms of the way in which the city is engaged with this this property. I guess what I'm getting at, Robert, is the parking lot was for their use as well. We have no way of knowing exactly what would happen with the property if we went through the sale, if it would uh, be developed or whatever, and there would go their ability to have parking. It would seem like they have a strong interest in this. They do have a strong interest in it, but then that would be a negotiation between those folks and the RCG folks in terms of how that Korea responds to those two entities. So they're they're in a place where they're trying to figure out if if the city is still involved with that, because if the city owns it, obviously it remains a parking lot. All of those spaces are outlined. They also have talked to some extent about being able to develop within the envelope of the property that they they own or redevelop in that in that if they don't need those 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 parking spaces that are out that uh, to the east of the property, you know they can they can they work with some kind of a redevelopment there. The answer is they're thinking about it, but they haven't formally uh, come up with a, a plan that would keep them within their development envelope. Okay, and my next question is regarding the estoppels. I guess that since they were put in place, the businesses are gone now that I think that they applied to. 
But since there were estoppels that everybody, businesses in the city agreed to, does that mean that everybody felt that everything was um, legal and um, correct in those documents with the option contract? I think you're waiting for me to answer that question. And Council Member Johnson, again, I can only make an assumption to answer that, that nobody would have given advice if they thought that they were asking the city to do anything illegal. That that would be my best guess. Um, but of course, uh, I wasn't around, so there's no way for me to actually know. And those uh, estoppel agreements do span I don't know, 15 to 17 years. So they were across uh, quite a, a, a length of time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Franks. Uh, thanks, Mayor Paul. And I just wanted to chime in and say that uh, all my questions that I had uh, written down before the meeting have all been asked and answered by others. But one did come up when the, it was mentioned that the 2040 vision plan for Colfax was going through its refresh and it would come to, in the summer. The only question I had was, is that a finalized refresh or is it in an iterative process and if we don't know at this point that's fine but it's one that just came to mind when it was mentioned that it would come i think to us in the summer robert or travis do you know the answer to that i i think that's still up in the air that so that is not a city-run process at this time it's it's a group of colfax uh associations and and people um that are that are leading that process uh, the city's at this point just a a participant and an observer of that process. So I don't think there's been any decision yet whether that's going to come through the normal city process and be a go to planning commission and council or or what the final outcome of that will be. Thanks. I mean, I, that gives me enough context. And obviously it came, it caught you off guard because uh, it just came up earlier. But thank you. And I have comments, uh, but I'll reserve those for when we get to the comment period. Okay. So I, I know just real quick here, Councillor Abel, I know you've been working on the 2040. Do you want to just clarify for Councillor Franks? Yes, I do. Uh, the original 2040 plan was uh, compiled with the through the direction of the planning department. Uh, I had uh, a number of neighborhoods participating. Uh, city at least one city council person was on it on the uh vision plan committee and it became part of our comp plan i would imagine that since this is a revision of the uh, document the city sponsored the last time that it would go through the same processes uh, because it will have the same weight as the original 2040 vision plan. So uh, I believe all our neighborhood plans, all additions to our comp plans go through city council. Thank you, Councilor Abel. I appreciate the additional information. Certainly. Okay, so let's go round two, Councilor Vincent. So from what I'm understanding is that we pay, this has got multiple contracts. We paid $5 million. We got approximately, I've heard, between 30 and $37 million of tax revenue from, from this. As I understand it, this million dollars is kind of what could be called the last payment on these agreements from 1992 or 1996. Am I understanding that correctly? Simplified. <laughs> Yes, this $1 million was actually just an established transfer fee to have a number in the document. Yes. Okay, that's what I understood. So thank you very much. All right. More questions, Council? I'm not seeing any hands. All right, Mayor Pro Tem, if I could have a motion, please. I move for the adoption of Ordinance 2021-2 to 
on second and final reading. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second comment. Councilor Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I will be uh, voting to support that this ordinance be passed this evening. And my thought process is that when the original $5 million was given to the prior um, ownership, that was to betterment of the Westland Mall, which did generate um, sales tax for us for many years. Even though, yes, the five million was attached to a parking lot, it really, we never really intended to own that parking lot the way other people think of it. Um, I believe now we're to the point where they've asked to um, exercise this option. I think we as a city need to own up to um, our contract that we've agreed to over 30 years. It is partly space saving with other developers and other entities that we might do business with. If we go back in and try to negotiate this, um, I think it'll shake the, the confidence that other entities might have to sign a contract with the city of Lakewood in the future. Um, I believe that this is, uh, we've had multiple uh, legal people look at this and have, have said that it is viable. It's, it's a good contract, maybe not necessarily in the way people are thinking the value of that land. But again, you got to remember, we didn't really ever intend to own that land the way a lot of people are thinking of. It was $5 million infused into a, um, a mall that needed help. So um, this was the, the, the vehicle that we used, and I will be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. I have Councilor Bita and then Abel. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, can you hear me all right? Okay. This is a complicated transaction involving many factors over which this council has no control, uh, such as the past history of the Westland Town Center and the terms of the so-called quote unquote option agreement. However, one thing is clear, the sale of this property is not in the best interest of the city of Lakewood, not the sale, not the price, and certainly not the unknown future of redevelopment of this area. The citizens of Lakewood have recognized these facts and have expressed their opposition to us loud and clear. This so-called quote unquote option agreement and sale appears to have been entered into by the then city manager on behalf of the city. The agreement is not dated. We have been provided no documentation which indicates that the then city council, sitting city council, approved this contract by ordinance or otherwise as required by city charter, only that we have a quote unquote contract. As has been pointed out, we do not know if the then city council would have approved the contract at that time. And yet it is assumed that was only, it was only an oversight that it was not reviewed by city council. But that is all mere speculation. This so-called option has some curious language in it which I'd like to point out. This is a quote. The making and performance of this contract and the agreements and other instruments required here under to be executed by Lakewood have been, or on the closing date, will have been duly authorized by all necessary municipal and other governmental action and will not violate any provisions of the city charter or any other city laws." End quote. Now this language recognizes that not all actions necessary to make this a binding agreement have been completed. The language is an attempt by the then unelected city manager to bind the elected members of a future city council. This city council, that's us some 30 years into the future. Such an attempt to circumvent the independent authority of elected officials is a violation of the separation of powers and it should not be allowed to stand. 
in the end, it is this council's responsibility and it's our authority to use our best judgment at this time, not a past city manager's judgment or, or another city council's past judgment in determining whether to approve this sale. That is our ob obligation under the city charter. This is why there are 11 votes, all elected by the people, so that we can use our collective judgment, experience, and wisdom to evaluate and act on these difficult types of issues. Given the disparity between the obvious intrinsic value of the property and the option price, given the additional great value to the city of this property in this area as it undergoes redevelopment, given that these terms were negotiated 30 years ago, absence today's changed and compelling circumstances, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, the precedence that would be set by allowing this elected body to be bound by the actions of a non-elected official, all in violation of the city charter. Accordingly, in good conscience, I cannot vote to support a document that at best is a statement of intent to take some future official action. That's what it is. This was obvious to both parties at the time the document was negotiated. I must therefore seriously question its enforceability. I will be voting no on this ordinance 0-2021-2. That's all. Great. Thank you, Councillor. I have Councillors Abel and then Johnson. You're still muted. Thank you, Mayor. I concur with a lot of things, the legal uh, uh, references that uh, Councilman Beta just made. Uh, but beyond that, uh, this is a deal that I don't see how it was ever good for the people of Lakewood. Certainly, the with the city's help and assistance, and tax incentive financing and public improvement fees, the uh, Westland Center made a comeback. And along with that comeback, the property owners there put away tidy profits. If the city got sales tax to the extent that we've been hearing about, then these folks made a really good profit for quite some time. Um, I suspect had uh, the anchor store at the uh, location not suffered so many uh, economic blows in those last few years, the uh, center might have still been thriving. Speaking of that uh, anchor, the last time I looked, which was just before the turn of the uh, year, uh, that retailer was delinquent on their taxes and had been for some time. So taking all that into account, uh, you know, they got their money back, uh, their uh, redevelopment money through tax breaks, tax incentive and uh, public improvement fees. When uh, again, when uh, Colfax was some years later, Colfax from Sheridan to Sims was declared an urban renewal area, the property tax was zeroed out. That's how urban renewal works. When that, pro when that segment of Colfax was declared an urban renewal area, it took $1 billion off the tax rolls of the taxing entities in this county. School board gets backfilled by those. The school district gets backfilled by the state. So they don't lose anything. The fire district, the metro districts, the water districts, everybody lost. But these folks didn't have to pay property taxes at that time either. Uh, so I think they did benefit from it already. I think this was a bad deal for our citizens to start with. And I think it's a bad deal for our citizens now. And I uh, do not 
appreciate being put in the position of having to approve a mistake made by city council 32 years ago. So I will not be voting for this either. Thank, Thank you, you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor Johnson and Councilor Springsteen. Well, thank you. Many of us remember when Westland was vibrant and a destination center. What we have now is heartbreaking. Vacant spaces with the exception of a dollar store and Lowe's and both of which I shop at. Recently for fun, I visited Apple Grove Mall or down off of South Santa Fe and to talk with people and learn, learn about their success down at that mall. Number one, they have inspiring facades. Uh, they're not monolithic. They're very charming. They have atmosphere. Number two, they have solid anchor stores like Apple, Pottery Barn, Williams Sonoma, Ted's Montana Grill destination stores and places that people want to shop and go to. Number three, when I asked about the surrounding community, it is residential, townhomes and single family homes. There was no high density near this mall. The composition of the surrounding neighborhood helps to drive what people buy and where they shop. If the city continues to build high density, we will likely to continue to attract convenience stores and gas stations. Businesses like Trader Joe's do demographic analysis of an area to ascertain if they'll be successful and if they want to go there. I am curious, has anyone in the city ever asked businesses what they are looking for? What attracts them to come to a certain mall? Like Alamo, Williams-Sonoma, Pottery Barn. There is no reason why Westland can't be a destination again. This council has an opportunity to have meaningful development on Colfax and in addition, pay attention to the 2040 vision plan that many very good people have spent hundreds of hours on. We can't continue to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. The developer so far has not been willing to say what his plans are for Westland and has little interest in working with the adjacent neighbors. That's not a healthy sign. Common sense would suggest and dictate that he will sell it and a new developer perhaps will build according to the current zoning, which would allow for high density. Continuing with high density build outs has become an issue in our community and in this city. Uh, all we have to do is look at the Union Corridor. And this land is zoned for high density. The city needs to reflect the vision of our citizens who, by the way, pay our salaries. One small item. The citizens expect us to take their vision forward. It is my understanding that the option contract was never codified either by the city or the developer as what we've heard previously. This to me seems like a very sloppy oversight that this wasn't really brought out, especially um, with those epistles. Doesn't this oversight make the contract basically invalid and not enforceable? Finally, the $1 million sale does not reflect the current market values. We, City Council, have a fiduciary responsibility here. In closing, Apparently, we voted that it was okay to have this kind of a, a meeting at 530 
Frankly, I don't recall that. But I think having an issue as weighty and as concerning as the Westland Shopping Center is at 5.30 has very terrible public perception. The optics couldn't be worse. And um, frankly, I hope we don't do this again. Finally, my vote for me is a moral issue. I cannot and will not support going forward with a sale that I believe is wrong on many levels, not just one. Let's work toward a way we can sit down with the owners and create a destination area and a win-win for everyone. And if that requires a courtroom environment, then so be it. I will be voting no. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. So I have Councillor Springsteen, Gutwein, and LaBeer. So I, I, I think we don't roll over and play dead in the time of COVID. I think that we don't just all go home right now and not represent our constituents. I think that our people, the people who voted for us, need us now more than ever in the time of COVID. And part of that is economic. And this is one of the hugest economic issues we've dealt with in many months on council. Uh, saving face with all due respect, we need to save face with the people who elected us. And every email, everything that I have seen on Lakewood Speaks is telling us, stand up for the people on this. Um, so uh, what I wanted to mention was some of the comments we got on Lakewood Speaks. And I think Lakewood Speaks, frankly, is a way to shut people up because nobody has heard these comments. Uh, Applewood Valley Neighborhood Association representing over 2,000 households wrote to us saying, what are you doing? Asking very good questions. How is the city of Lakewood benefiting from this lopsided deal? Why is the current city council attempting to make up for messy, um, the messy, smelly deal of long ago? Why is RCG in the driver's seat? These are very good questions. Nobody has heard today. Um, we got another comment from Lynn Kinney asking, uh, uh, once again, you are attempting to execute a transaction with a developer to the detriment of the citizens of Lakewood. Um, and then yet another comment from Katie Owens at Miller Heights Neighborhood Association. These are people representing many, many people in the city of Lakewood saying uh, they're located directly behind Westland and all of the neighbors are very afraid our neighborhood will be destroyed if we have a big apartment complex at the end of our street. Us, all of them asking, why are we doing this at 5.30 at night? Instead of during a normal council meeting, I had also a constituent who wrote to me who said he was actually at the council meeting where this plan came about. And it was originally financially helped for the developer. The city loaned them the money and the parking lot was collateral along with that they wouldn't have to pay property taxes or stormwater. They got the city to pay for public service fees and also paid for water and sewer fees. Somebody has benefited from this for many, many, many years. Um, I have to say, we have extenuating circumstances. We have voted on an emergency uh, um, situation for months and months in this city. We have an emergency situation. We need to treat this vote as if we are in an emergency situation. And that means we have to protect our constituents who voted for us 
in the in this financial transaction. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Gutwein Labear Skilling. Yes, thank you. Um, so, you know, one thing I've learned through uh, being on, on city council and in my time in, uh, in public service is that, you know, when it comes to legal documents and legal questions, you can find an attorney or a person with an opinion that supports anything you want. Um, and, you know, I've learned to really think about who whose opinion I trust and what the likelihoods are of various outcomes. And, you know, we just went through a extensive process to find a new city attorney. Um, and, you know, I think it's, I, I just think it's a little bit unfortunate that we're um, kind of questioning or, not questioning, I think it's always good to question, um, but it's just, I, I guess this conversation is just a little bit unfortunate in my opinion. Um, secondly, regarding fiduciary responsibility, um, I guess I have a different take. My, in reading all the documents and in, in learning about this issue, um, I think we could absolutely go to court. We can go to court on any issue, any issue, any day, all day long. But we, if we're gonna, if we're likely to lose, I believe it's my fiduciary responsibility to not go to court on that issue. Instead, it's my responsibility to tell you, our community, the reality of the situation which is we're kind of painted in a corner. And um, so with just with this contract, not with the future of Colfax, we have so many legal options to help us shape the future of this area, which I believe we should we should exercise, we should use, and we should shift this conversation from something that is a dead end, waste of time, costly, frankly, exhausting, um, and filled with so much misinformation to something that is productive. And can we instead work together to use the, our zoning tools to help um, ensure that our community vision is becomes a reality. And that would also, you know, that would require all of us who have really different opinions on growth to maybe compromise a little instead of being all really extreme on one side and really extreme on the other to kind of see if we can meet somewhere in the middle so that we can get something done for, for our community. Um, and then I just, I know that some folks are gonna be so irritated when I say this, but I'm just gonna read one thing from the 2040 vision plan. It says, why develop a project on West Colfax? This is page 44 of the, what, um, the West Colfax, uh, 2040 plan. Lakewood has created and adopted special plans for West Colfax and each of the light rail stations in the corridor. The Lakewood zoning ordinance has been modified to allow for appropriate densities and mixed use development to occur in this area with administrative review. The entitlements are in place. So, you know, there was support for the zoning that is in place, not by everyone, certainly we all know that, but by some. And so we can continue to change it. We can continue to update it. I would love to move forward and, and really just, you know, use the legal tools that we have to make this vision a reality. So I will be supporting this. Thank you. All right. I think, did I mayor pro tem skilling and then Councillor LeBeer or was it vice versa? 
Gals of the beer. All right. Well, thank you, Mayor. And uh, thank you, everybody who's already uh, spoke up uh, uh, about this issue so far. Uh, you know, I just want to mention, I, I love Colfax. I live off Colfax. I went to college off Colfax. I work off Colfax, not on Colfax. Um, I've been working to fulfill the 2040 plan the entire time I've been on council. And the community is absolutely right. The community uh, should have their fingerprints on this side of town. And I think uh, we're all in agreement on that. I think the full council uh, agrees with that. That's my my perception. Uh, I think the only thing we differ on is how we get there. And, you know, I think when it re relates to this contract, I think, you know, to me, reneging on an agreement will challenge future agreements. That's the first piece. I think not fulfilling our agreements will likely leave us with costly litigation. Uh, that I think at best, uh, a win looks like an old gray parking lot and an empty shopping center. I think that's that's what the win of a potential uh, litigation uh, scenario looks like. And I think at worst, we'll be on the hook for legal fees and potential economic losses. And I think the developer uh, will inevitably, at some point in time, uh, do whatever they want under their entitlements and we'll be the bad faith actors and who at that time would want to work with this. I think that's a, a valid question we should keep in mind. And I think even if we go through all those challenges, potential expenses, we'll still have the underlying issues at play. If the community thinks we didn't do a good job planning or zoning correctly, that'll all still be true with or without the sale. So meaning what the community wants a good future plan and being consistent with the 2040 plan that that'll still be in limbo with or without a sale. So I think we should push hard for reviewing the plan in the area and ensure that it conforms uh, with the desires of the community. And I think we should focus on the actual problem. Uh, to me, what brings successful developments is beautification, infrastructure, uh, ending blight. Those things bring higher value properties and if you have any disillusions about that go look a few blocks east of colfax and sheridan i live right next to colfax and sheridan not too far uh, a couple blocks in go a few blocks east near sloan's lake they're selling million dollar condos next to apartments uh next to townhomes they built an alamo theater they have starbucks vegan health shop they have chiba hut uh, how's Lakewood's strategy going? That's what they're doing over there. How's our strategy going? We're fighting crime in local motels. So I think, uh, you know, we can take some corrective actions ourselves uh, to lead and, and, and encourage uh, development in the right way here. And we can do what we can and use the tools under our charter to curb uh, the challenges and the things that the community doesn't like seeing. We, we can take on those issues. Uh, we've heard them. We hear them every single meeting. So I think we should put our energy into that, making sure uh, Colfax develops in the right way and that we don't just get the bad stuff uh, that nobody wanted. And we do that by making sure we have good planning, good infrastructure, good beautification, uh, you know, funding our economic development. Uh, I think that's how we get there. And I'm happy to work with every single one of you uh, to make that happen. Yeah, but I will be voting for the sale to get this moving so we don't have uh, more dilapidated properties on Colfax. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Skilling. Thank you. Uh, so I agree with actually a lot of the sentiments that have been made, you know, starting with our first caller tonight, um, uh, or first or second caller, whenever the stuff he called in. I agree with most of what Councillor Johnson had to say. I agree with, you know, almost everybody on here. What I struggle with is that I'm not comfortable using this contract issue and entering, you know, a, a perilous, I'll just call it a perilous litigation. Any litigation is fraught with problems, economic and otherwise. And that shouldn't be the, the proxy fight of demanding a well-received development, something that all the neighbors want to see. This shouldn't be the, uh, the, the fight that we have. We should have this robust conversation with 
a lot of public comment and all the ward means it should be the talk of the town what's happening at Weston, but it should be talked about in the appropriate setting, not discussing a contract and going into litigation, spending money and doing all that, which as Council LeBeer said, that a win could just mean a parking lot. To be clear, we can't develop a park, period. It's a parking lot till 2082. We can't extract, and extract is too harsh. I, I don't mean it in that way. We cannot get the type of development that the people want to see using a sledgehammer and using litigation to somehow, what, scare the big bad developer into doing what we want? As I recall, many of our council members have met with these folks. Many of our staff members have met with this folk, these folks, and here we are. Now, we do have tools. We can zone the property. We can have a bigger vision, have all the neighborhood folks come out. I asked questions earlier of staff for a reason. Unlike some of the developments that we fought a few years ago, including some that may or may not be really close to my neighborhood, may or may not include a whole bunch of apartments, that project was way down the road, way down the road. They had done all their applications, they had done all of them. And so we, the city, were gonna be on the hook for it. And I, I'll bet you all recall these conversations we had. There wasn't a whole heck of a lot of support when Barb and I were crying about, well, not crying, but we were voicing our opinion that, hey, maybe we should just go fight this thing. And then they said, well, here's the problem. We said they could do it all along and now you're gonna pull the rug under them. We're gonna cost us a bunch of money. That is exactly the opposite of now. Now, none of that exists. We've got a vision plan in place that is actively working. After we've heard the community come out for this, I'm pretty sure there's gonna be a lot of support for doing something on that property. That's what we should be focused on. And I do not like using this litigation or a, a potential litigation or a contract issue, to which I haven't heard any compelling evidence tonight that uh, that really does a whole lot. What does a lot is bringing these same people that we've heard public comment talk about a, a contract issue, bring them back for the time that we can actually make a real change. And we can make a real change through the zoning tools that we have. And I've heard a lot of people tonight commit to that. So let's focus on seeing what the neighborhood wants to do. That's how you can work with a developer. That's how you can get what you want, is by using our tools. We can prevent certain things from being certain places. We should do that. Not rely on a judge or a jury or some contract issue. We should do what we have the power as a city to do. That's all I have. Thank you. Councilor Springsteen, your hand is up and you already went. Can you be brief, please? So, uh, Councilor Franks and Skilling, you know, 2090 was part of what got you elected. The city didn't see that as perilous litigation in a fight against the neighbors. And I would say we are never painted into a corner. And I have a certain perspective on this as an, as an attorney. We have to negotiate. 99.9% .9 of cases do not go to trial. And that is because people settle. And so if you just roll over and play dead, there, there's, there's no leverage. You can't settle. And so that is what I'm arguing here. We are setting a precedent. We are setting a precedent here. If we lay down and play dead, we they will run roughshod over us in every single deal in this city. It is time to stand up for our constituents. And that is what I'm asking for. And I hope that was brief enough. Thank you. Councillor Franks, I'll let you reply since you were referenced. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Paul. Um, I certainly did want to respond. I mean, I certainly know the 2090 issues intimately, spent more than a thousand hours of my personal time uh, digging into every single document. So uh, certainly don't need any reminders about that. And certainly have always, 
always stood up for my constituents, but I too have a fiduciary responsibility to look at all the information and make quality decisions. So I certainly just wanted to respond to that, that there has never been a time since I've been on council that I have not stood up and represented my citizens, but I do also have other guiding documents, the charter and others. And so thank you very much. That's all I have to say. Great, thank you. All right, any other comments? Okay, so I, I'm gonna address a few things. I certainly trust that this council's reviewed the legal, financial, and land use implications of what's before us. Um, this is the finalization of a transfer that started in 1992. I certainly don't envy our counselors in Ward 1. There's a lot of pressure and it's this is tough. But I also know that everybody on this council cares tremendously about this opportunity and about the surrounding neighbors. I think unfortunately, because of the complications of this and because of some information that's been out in the public, it's made it even more challenging. And I certainly respect everybody's votes and where they must come from tonight. When we did meet originally, we had an executive session and we gave the city manager and Mr. Smith direction. They took that and tried to do what they could. They also came back and offered, RCG offered the opportunity for this entire council, every single council member to meet with them. Some of you had that opportunity, some of you took advantage of it. There was something mentioned by two council members about not approving this meeting tonight. Well, that was on February 8th, 11 to zero. This council voted to take this issue up tonight at 5.30 prior to the 7 p.m. Um, we heard from Applewood Valley tonight, not only on Lakewood Speaks, but we heard from them on a phone call. And for many folks in wards one and two, including myself, have met with many of the people who represent the neighborhood organizations, have discussed this at length at WCCA and other events. And the, the deal is, it is what it is, and it's not amazing for anybody. Um, I know RCG is listening, and I hope that no matter how this turns out, that they will be a partner with this city and that they really hear the passion that this community and this neighborhood has. You know, there's talk about density and, and you know, density just brings gas stations. You know, there's something in the contrary. You go to Cherry Creek and it's very dense and it's one of the most vibrant and probably the only successful mixed use project in, in the metro area. Aspen Grove was mentioned. And there's a headline in the Littleton Independent that said Aspen Grove could see overhaul. And it says battered by COVID economy, shopping center in Littleton looks for a restart. Aspen Grove shopping center in South Littleton could be headed for a total overhaul into a mixed use residential retail and office complex if a proposal moves forward. Folks, retail is in trouble all throughout and we have to take the opportunity to find ways to be smarter and better. And yes, density does come into play. But many folks who didn't want density also supported the SGI, which said density should be within blighted areas to reinvigorate them. So, you know, none of this is easy and it is certainly quite challenging. And I think that, you know, this idea that you have to stand up for the people we all represent different constituencies. Each one of you represent the whole city and then 25 to 30,000 folks in your ward. And I represent the entire city as mayor and elected at large. And I know that we've heard from a lot of folks, we have to do our job and we have to do it to the best of our abilities. We have to honor our fiduciary responsibility. And I've had to have some tough conversations with people about what that means. and. I want to thank Ms. Hodson and certainly Mr. Smith, Ms. McKinney Brown, Mr. Graham for, for all the heavy work on this. And unfortunately, a lot of times, especially in the community, you somehow get blamed for the things that you have nothing to do with other than just trying to exercise and execute your job. And so thank you for that. And, and I do just want to say that document that uh, was put together that was referenced tonight was very well done and answered a lot of questions for a lot of people in the community. So with that, I certainly uh, will be supporting this and 
I want RCG to hear me loud and clear. We would like you to be at the table as we move forward. And that's very important to this community. So we have a motion and a second. Please cast your votes. It looks like that passes seven eyes, four nays, the nays being Beta, Springsteen, Johnson, and Abel. All right, we will now adjourn and for Channel 8's purposes, we will come back. It's 7.32 right now. Is that an accurate time that we're showing? Yeah, 7.32 right now. So let's come back for our study session at 7.40. So we'll come back and that gives enough for 7.40. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, did you have something you wanted to say? Are we on the same Zoom? I forget. I mean, I look in the email. I just want to be clear for all of council. Is this, the, are we staying in this Zoom and just going no, quiet for a bit? It's a separate meeting. And I believe okay. Bruce has sent another link. So we're going Got off. It off this and onto a new one. Sorry, Bruce, you probably should have answered that. Thank you. I think I'm right. You are, absolutely. Okay. okay. So we'll adjourn this at 7.33 p.m. and be back at 7.40. Uh, do you want to just do 7.45 for the study yes. session? Does that work? Okay. We'll see you at 7.45 for the study session. <laughs>